So um, we're we're in this series uh, dealing with the um, end times and trying to um, look at scripture and then match scripture to um, you know what we're seeing transpire right before us in the current events of the world, understanding what the Bible has said, um, seeing it played out uh, before us, giving us an idea of where we are in the timeline of things. You'll see me, you'll hear me refer to timeline um, uh, a few times throughout this study. Um, and the, the necessity of it is that we recognize what has already transpired what is yet to transpire and um, how we kind of fit into that. There are uh, a variety of beliefs and um, theological statements related to the church and where we fall in all of the end time prophecy, understanding that end time prophecy really is about the nation of Israel, the Jews, God's chosen people, um, and all of these things are being done to draw them back to him, um, to recognize that Jesus is the Messiah, the son of the living God. Um, but in the interim, there is the church and how the church comes into play. What is, um, you know, essentially going to happen to the church and um, kind of our beliefs related to um, where we are in that timeline and when we can expect to be out of here. And even that is debatable and it's arguable. Um, throughout this study, this series, I'm going to give you what I believe. I'm not telling you that, you know, in any stretch of the imagination that what I'm saying, it, this is, you know, 100 you percent know, what God has said and this is how it's going to happen and so on and so forth. I'm just telling you what I believe based upon what I hear from the Lord based upon the study, uh, understanding the interpretation of scripture, the playing out of events and uh, things of that nature. Um, my view is in line with, with a lot of prominent, um, you know, views related to uh, end times. So I'm not out in left field by myself. Um, so I'm just gonna share with you again, you know, how I feel about things. You know, and again, ultimately, this is all about the Jews. We're blessed in the process of all of this, but this is really about the Jews and the manifestation of God's spoken word to them. So to kind of understand where we are, we kind of have to go back a little ways. Uh, most of the prophetic utterance that's been revealed outside of Revelation is directly in the Old Testament. Um, so let, if we go back, you know, to understanding the Jews, you'll find that the Hebrews exodus from Egypt resulted in a very powerful event of God, uh, probably one of the most climactic uh, things, miraculous things that, you know, we've ever seen or heard. Uh, and that's the parting of the Red Sea. And you can read about that in the 14th chapter of the book of Exodus. Now, we understand reading this, that this was a supernatural event that to this day, I can't say has been duplicated or even um, anything greater has come along in, in my own humble view. Um, there was a purpose, though, for the miracle of the parting of the Red Sea, and that miracle was to memorialize in the minds of the Hebrew generations that would follow and hear of the story of the crossing, um, how God parted the sea and crossed the nation through dry land after the sea had been parted and then crushed the enemy with the very sea that had been parted, uh, you know, that they would not overtake them. This would be something that stirred uh, the Jews. It would serve to remind the Jews that their God, Jehovah, could deliver them through any and every obstacle, any and every oppression that they would face in the times that were to come. And in addition to this monumental miracle of God, the Old Testament is also filled with other historical uh, examples evidencing the fact that God consistently has the back of his people. But if we move over to Jeremiah, to the 23rd chapter and the 7th verse, 
This is what it declares. It declares that the Exodus episode will will pale in comparison to the modern day miracle of the rebirthed nation of Israel. So you, you think about in uh, contrast to what uh, has occurred, the parting of the Red Sea, never seen anything like it since. An amazing event, demonstration of God's power and control over creation. And that is going to pale and everything else up to this point is going to pale in comparison to the miracle that God is going to perform for Israel. And I believe that the Lord had to accomplish much more than just parting the Red Sea to, uh, you know, in order to reestablish the nation of Israel in our modern day. So let me give you a few examples that depict the enormous sovereign undertaking of God in order for Israel to exist today. And I want you to understand, again, to understand where we are, we have to know where we've been. So as we look at Israel and we begin to uh, analyze how it is what it is today, you can see systematically, it actually will bring to your understanding why certain events in human history took place when you begin to think about them within the perspective of God's spoken word concerning the rebirth of the nation of Israel. The first thing that God had to do uh, for Israel was implant Zionism uh, in the Jews. Now, Zionism is the term that's associated with the national movement for the return of the Jewish people to their homeland and the resumption of that uh, uh, people's sovereignty in their land. Now, in the late 1800s, after centuries of existence outside or existence in exile from their country, the Jews began to yearn to turn back to their ancient homeland. And they were and still are willing to leave every other place they are in the world, including diverse cultures and differing languages, in order to return to a place that was desolate and is presently dangerous. We know that Israel right now is not, the, it, it is not the vacation spot you want to go to right now. Something else that God did that, that's amazing. Not only does he, does he implant this desire to draw them back to the land that he promised them, but he created a uh, Arab homeland. So from 1517 to 1917, the Middle East was under the control of the Ottoman Empire. Now, this is where human history begins to play a role in what God is doing. The domination of the Ottoman Empire during this time uh, abruptly ends with the Turkish loss in World War I. You begin to wonder why world wars took place, why things happened in human history. There are things that God intended to take place that could not take place until specific things happened. And I believe that World War I was one of those things. So the Ottoman Empire is in control, but they lose in World War I. And that empire had to be eliminated in order for the Middle East to be rezoned with both Arab and Jewish states. So the creation of the Arab state and the Jewish state is the fulfillment of the Lord's Mideast peace plan provided in Jeremiah, the 12th chapter, the 14th through the 17th verse. Jeremiah, the 12th chapter, the 14th through the 17th verse. This is God's Mideast plan. And this prophecy specifies that the Arabs and the Jews would return to their homelands, which occurred uh, in the aftermath of the collapse of the Ottoman Empire. And this is what the Bible declares. Thus says the Lord against all my evil neighbors who touch the inheritance, which I have caused my people Israel to inherit. Behold, I will pluck them out of their land and pluck out the house of Judah from among them. Then it shall be after I have plucked them out that I will return and have compassion on them and bring them back, everyone that's Jews and Arabs, to his heritage and everyone to his land. And it shall be if they will learn carefully the ways of my people to swear by my name as the Lord lives, as they taught my people to swear by Baal, then they shall be established in the midst of my people. 
But if they do not obey, I will utterly pluck up and destroy that nation, says the Lord. This is Jeremiah 12, 14 through 17. So this is another uh, dramatic thing that God had to do. There's something else that took place in human history that God had to intervene in um, so that the things spoken concerning the Jews would take place. And that's the uh, genocide uh, by the Germans, uh, the, the Nazis. So he had to pre prevent the fulfillment. Now, six over six million Jews were killed, but uh, the idea or the goal of Hitler was to wipe out every Jew. Now, in order for the Jewish state to exist, Jews needed to exist. They cannot exist if they're dead. So during World War II, Adolf Hitler and the Nazis attempted to, you know, to complete the act of genocide against the Jews. And they had been, you know, had they had been successful, there would be no Israel today. But if you look at World War I, you find that this is what World War I does. It frees the land, the ancient land of the Israels. Everything that was under control by a foreign power was now back into the control. That land was back into the, the control of Israel. Now, World War II prepares the Jews for the land that God restored to them. It puts them in the position to go back in. So you look at what happens in World War II. A, a very strange thing happens in World War II. The Allied forces, mainly the United States and everyone that stood on their side, and communist Russia teamed up with the capital, you know, with the capitalists of America uh, and, and all the allied forces. They teamed up together, a very strange group of nations coming together to defeat the uh, German, uh, you know, invasion against the world. And, and this cohesion of, uh, you know, unlikely, um, you know, uh, nations who couldn't stand each other before the war and arguably barely can stand each other after that war, uh, God brought them together. And this is a miraculous sovereign undertaking uh, of God. It prepares the people and uh, the land. If you look at uh, the, re the return of the Arabs and the return of the Jews, you, you see Afghanistan being established in 1919, Egypt in 1922, Saudi Arabia and Iraq in 1932, Iran in 1935, Lebanon in 1943, Syria and Jordan in 1946, and to cap it all off, Israel in 1948. So it's important to note that Jeremiah 12 and 17 predicts the destruction of the Arab nations that curse Israel instead of living peacefully alongside Israel as God had instructed them to do. And this destruction seemingly will occur with the prophecy that is revealed to us in the what's called the Psalm 83 war. And we're going to talk about that um, you know, more as we get along in, in this series, but I don't want to get into that just yet. Something else that God had to do, you know, he creates the Jewish state with, uh, you know, the control of the Ottoman Empire now relinquished and the establishment of the Arab states in place, the restoration of Israel occurs, you know, this territorial shift paves the way for the state of Israel to come into existence. He empowers Israel to be formidable in the land. So if we look at Ezekiel, the 37th chapter and the 10th verse, the 25th chapter and the 14th verse, Obadiah, the first chapter and the 18th verse, and there are a few other places also, it actually scripturally predicts the rise of what we know now as the Israeli Defense Force, the IDF. Through the process of these three regional wars in 1948, 1967, and 1973, the Jews transformed themselves from refugees into the most powerful army in the Middle East. And this had to happen in order for Israel's existence to be sustained. God blessed them to become a terror to their enemies. The IDF is a recognized uh, military might and the most powerful in the Middle East. This is why other nations don't just run right in there because they know they have to deal with the IDF. God also preserves and prospers Israel. Now, 
Israel is becoming a, a prosperous nation. And according to Ezekiel, the 38th chapter, the 12th through the 13th verse, Israel continues to prosper and achieve an abundance of plunder. And it's that, that very prosperity that's going to motivate the Russian Gog of Magog invaders to attack Israel. And the upholding of God's holy name through his people Israel. The Magog invasion that's talked about in the 38th and 39th chapters of Ezekiel uh, and, and is another major prophetic marker for our generation to look at. And I believe that we will uh, see that invasion. I believe that what is building up right now uh, in that territory um, and also what's going on with uh, Russia and their failed invasion um, of, U uh, or, uh, of um, um, Ukraine, that that failed invasion of Ukraine, you know, Putin had, uh, you know, boasted that it'd be days and, and they would have Ukraine and it'd be no problem. And here it is, it's now past the year mark and they're still entrenched in war. Ukraine is still resisting, still fighting, and it's not like they're just, you know, rebels fighting. They are dealing massive losses. Even Russia internally, is uh, there's turmoil and struggle uh, in the leadership and, and, you know, issues there that uh, at one point turned one of his uh, most fiercest generals uh, against him, and they were on their way to march to um you know, to the capital to take over. And then, um, you know, they there was a peace deal worked out between the, the two leaders. And um, now one the one is dead and you can read what you want into that. But um, we see that Russia is getting to a place where it's going to need the prosperity of Israel. And this is what leads them into the Gog and Magog war, the invasion of Israel. Now, in Ezekiel, it contains 43 verses of some of the most consolidated and descriptive prophetic um, bits of information that's found anywhere within the entirety of the Bible. And when you read these passages, you don't need to be a Bible scholar or a rocket scientist, a theologian, uh, or anything special uh, to glean a relatively detailed understanding of this you know, forthcoming prophecy. By interpreting the verses literally, we are made aware of several things. First off, the timing of the event. We know that it's going to happen in the end times. Ezekiel 38, verse 8, and 38, verse 16. We know who the invaders are. It identifies the invading coalition. And, and I like to look at the invading coalition uh, as the outer ring. And I call them that because the nations that are going to invade uh, Israel um, in, in the Gog and Magog uh, war do not border Israel. So it's not the Arabs. It's going to be uh, other nations. Um, they don't share a common border with Israel. And, and we get that from the book of Ezekiel, the 38th chapter, the first through the fifth verse. You'll find that the invaders don't share a border. The motivation for the invasion of Israel, we understand in 38, uh, 12 through 13, the purpose is to take the spoil or the plunder or the prosperity of Israel. They need it to further their own war machine. The conditions uh, inside of Israel at the time of the Gog and Magog war are also shared with us. The Bible tells us that in Ezekiel 38, verse 8, verse 11, and verse 14, that Israel will be a nation at peace that is dwelling securely without walls. It is a nation of peace that's dwelling securely without walls at the time of the Gog and Magog invasion. The Bible also, and, and I'm going to get more into that here in a second. The, the Bible also tells us that the invaders will not be defeated by the IDF. They will not be defeated by uh, any military, uh, other military might that comes to the aid, uh, you know, ally like America. Um, the Bible tells us that the invaders are going to be defeated by a supernatural power, earthquakes, pestilence, bloodshed, flooding rains, great hailstone, fire, brimstone, all kinds of things like that are going to take place that's going to swallow up. And at one point, the Bible even talks about the 
earth opening and swallowing up the invading army, Ezekiel 38, verses 18 through 23. It also tells us that the aftermath of the Gog and Magog event, um, Israel is going to gain much international re re renown because it's going to take seven months to bury and burn uh, to bury all the invaders and burn all the invaders' weapons and, and you know tanks and airplanes and all this kind of stuff. And to burn those things, it's going to take seven years. Ezekiel 39, 9 through 16. Then the Bible tells us the purpose for you know this all to take place. And that's to uphold the holy name of God, Ezekiel 39 and 7. So the Lord appears to have intended that these specific verses be relatively easy for everybody that reads them to understand, because this is the epic event through which he pledges to notify the world that he is the one true God. And there will be no way to misconstrue that the supernatural destruction of the Magog invaders came exclusively through the hand of God. Even though Israel is, is positively identified within this prophecy and, and arguably, and this is arguably, um, America may be, a, may be mentioned um, in this prophecy as well. And again, that's arguable. Uh, but the victory over the Russian coalition will not be attributed to either um, possibly America or Israel. But the Lord will get the full credit. Matter of fact, in the aftermath, he alone will receive the credit for uh, Israel's victory. The Lord will have validated his sovereignty over the affairs of men as declared in Isaiah, the 46th chapter and the 10th verse, where it says, I, the Lord, will do all my pleasure. The Lord will be able to proclaim with absolute authority that he is the covenant keeping God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob who sent his only begotten son, Jesus Christ, so that all who receive him as their Lord and Savior would not perish, but have eternal life. Now, in my studies of the book of Ezekiel, the 38th chapter, I believe that this specific Gog and Magog war occurs before the seven-year tribulation period. This is what I believe. Uh, again, there are others that believe differently. Um, there are others even from them that believe, um, you know, in a, in a totally different thing. But I believe that from what we read, and if we, if we match what we're reading with what we are seeing, I believe that we are in route to that now, you know, this uh, famed Daniel's 70th week. I, I believe that we're building toward that war now with what's occurring in the Middle East and the devastation uh, of the Russian forces in the Ukrainian invasion and I also believe that the rapture occurs before both Ezekiel 38 and the tribulation period. I believe biblical, historical, and ge geopolitical arguments uh, are provided in scripture, which evidence how America could be identified in Ezekiel 38 and 13 as the young lion of the merchants of Tarshish. Now, if you look at scripture, you'll find that the Bible talks about two lions, an old lion and a young lion from Tarshish. It's, it's universally recognized that the old lion is England, the, the, uh, the British uh, monarchy, that that is the old lion. And it is presumed that the young lion that is being referenced is America. We know that we are headed towards our 250th year of existence uh, as a nation. And um, we come out of England. So the young lion coming out of the old lion, these are the things that we use to substantiate that uh, this is how America is, is involved. However, if you pay attention to what's going on, you'll find that in prophecy, America is depicted as a lesser nation or a meager spectator of the Magog invasion. Now, if you pay attention to what's going on right now and you're listening to the news, you'll find that what is a common thread that's being stated is that America is showing itself each and every day weaker and weaker and weaker in its leadership that its leadership is afraid to do things and is really just idly sitting back and letting the enemy have its way. At this point, to last count, 66 attacks against 
American uh, military um, installations uh, in the Middle East region with, um, you know, arguably um, very weak response not consistent with the responses that we've done in the past when we were seen as a very powerful and strong and influential uh, nation. We're seeing that that influence doesn't carry the weight. The American dollar doesn't carry the weight that it once did. There's even a push now for a different currency that several nations in that region of the world have you know, uh, joined into. We're seeing, you know, the current conflict that, you know, our great America, this great nation, we have no political influence in the Middle East at all. And, you know, even at one time we were a military great power, even that might, it, it means nothing because our leadership won't use it. We're seeing warning after warning by America just being ignored. We're, we're hearing our leaders say, don't do this, and then the enemy does it, and then nothing happens. And uh, America is being attacked with no real military response. And, and we're going to get more into that as we continue in this study. But we're seeing the manifestation of uh, what the scriptures are detailing for us. Now, Ezekiel 38, 7 through 13, lists several prerequisites that must in, uh, exist inside of Israel before the Magog invasion can occur. So it tells us in the 38th chapter, seven things to look for. And when these seven things are in place, the Magog, uh, God Magog invasion is going to happen. Israel must be reestablished as a nation uh, in the latter years. And, and you know, this is the case that we see. Israel is a nation today. But the country needs to be inhabited by a peaceful Jewish people that dwells securely without walls, bars, or gates. Okay, you got to pay attention to scripture. We know that Israel is probably one of the most gated places, walled places in the world. Additionally, Israel must possess a sufficient surplus of spoil uh, or prosperity because that is what the uh, God may God coalition is going to come after. So if this prophecy is to be interpreted literally, it is safe to say that Israel is not dwelling without walls today. In fact, the Middle East is the most fenced in and fortified region in the world, and Israel is arguably the most walled in uh, country in the entirety of the Middle East. And, and this is another point to consider as we examine the scripture. Israel still depends upon the wall and the technology that's in the wall that they have built to prevent attacks. But now you have to begin to question to yourself, one of the things that's come up in the Hamas invasion from the Gaza Strip, where it was walled, the technology in the wall failed. There was um, you know, what they call uh, the, you know, the military that does all of the, you know, like I, our version of the CIA, their, their um, secret agent, so to speak, that's supposed to have all this intelligence and know all this stuff and the technology that's in the wall uh, that's not supposed to fail. That's supposed to alert in so much time that uh, a, a military response could prevent such a, a, you know, an atrocity that we saw on October the 7th. Uh, all these things. But you're seeing that they failed. All these things in place failed. And it, it causes you to begin to, you look at uh, what scripture says about Israel being a city without gates and without walls. Um, so one of the things that could happen is the removal or the no longer dependency upon the walls for safety to fulfill this prophetic uh, state. And this could be the, you know, because of the, the failure of the wall, this could be the precursor to the removal of the wall itself. Now, some contend that Israel is dwelling securely today. So some will argue that they are secure today. And they generally define the security that's described in Ezekiel 38, 8, and 11, and 14 as more uh, of a relative confidence in the ability of the IDF to defend the Jewish nation. So they're at peace to the degree that they believe that nothing you know, could defeat their forces. Now, I agree that the, ID, that the Israeli Defense Force, the IDF, uh, you know, can uh, do amazing things, but I thoroughly disagree with this interpretation that um, they are 
in peace and secure as the Bible is talking about. Because if you look at Ezekiel's intended usage of the Hebrew words, uh, which come out dwelling securely, it deals with a security that is uh, achieved through military conquest over Israel's surrounding Arab enemies. And we discovered this uh, 10 chapters earlier in the book of Ezekiel, the 28th chapter. So we talk about the security. It's not the security because they can defend themselves. The Hebrew words that are used to describe that security, and again, you have to keep everything in context, and you have to look at how the words are uh, being used and uh, to fit the, the proper interpretation. Uh, it's a military type of security that is because of conquest, not because I can defend, but because I have already conquered all of my enemies. So I'm secure because all my enemies are uh, done away with. But let's look at scripture in, in Ezekiel 28. And it says, and there shall no longer be a pricking briar or a painful thorn for the house of Israel from among all who are around them, who despise them. Then they shall know that I am the Lord God. Thus says the Lord God, when I have gathered the house of Israel from the peoples among whom they are scattered and am hollowed in, their, in them in the sight of the Gentiles, then they will dwell in their own land, which I gave to my servant Jacob, and they will dwell safely there, build houses and plant vineyards. Yes, they will dwell securely when I execute judgments on all those around them who despise them. Then they shall know that I am the Lord their God. That's Ezekiel 28, 24 through 26. So then if you look at this in connection with secu uh, dwelling securely without walls, as described in Ezekiel 38, the question or the pertinent question for today is, does Israel have enemies surrounding them that despise them? Well, the answer is a resounding yes. They, they definitely have enemies around them. They all happen to be uh, listed as, uh, you know, warring factions in the uh, Psalm 83 war that we're going to get into later on. Now, these uh, enemies that surround them, I, I refer to them as the inner circle, and that's the Arab states, the terrorist populations within those states that exist, that share common borders with Israel. And due to the existence of these unsatisfied, uh, you know, un incomplete uh, prerequisites that are spelled out in Ezekiel 38, 7 through 13, the Ezekiel 38 through 39 predictions are appropriately classified as what's going to happen next. This is what we should be looking for to occur next. And this presumably uh, precludes, um, you know, the Psalm 83, the concluding uh, at, uh, Arab Israeli war that needs to happen before Israel can dwell securely and remove any walls that are protecting it from its surrounding en enemies. So then we, when we look at the timeline of things between now and what's next, you know, the next set of prophecies in Ezekiel, we can insert the Psalm 83 war as a stage setter for the Ezekiel events. Psalm 83 could happen at any time. This, and this is the Arab and Israeli war. This could be, the Psalm 83 war could be what we are seeing right now, the war that is in existence between uh, Hamas, um, and, and we understand that Iran um, is using what is referred to as proxy forces to wage war against uh, Israel. Um, they're, you know, they're giving all the instruction, they're giving all the resources, they're giving all the military um, training and all these different things to Hamas and, and, and these different Hezbollah and, uh, you know, there's several other forces that are in the area um, to engage Israel. It hasn't broken out into an all out war specifically. So we have a, right now a war on one front with the possibility of a war on multiple fronts, which I believe will be the Psalm 83 war, and it could be happening at any moment. Now, the only minor condition that stands between now and the Psalm 83 war 
uh, are two paper thin peace treaties that exist between Israel and Jordan and Israel and Egypt. Now, Egypt probably and Jordan most certainly are participants in the Psalm 83 war. So right now there is a very fragile peace accord between Jordan and Israel, Egypt and Israel that I don't believe will stand. I think it'll fall into what we uh, constantly see throughout the history, and that is the uh, failure of the peace accords and the peace agreements in that region of the land. Are there any questions to this point? Okay, so then what's, what's going to happen then? What what prophecies fill this gap between, you know, right now and, and this Magog invasion? Well, Psalm 83, I believe, is among the right now prophecies that's going to happen between now and the time that the Lord upholds his name in that Magog war. But there are several other biblical predictions that could possibly happen before Ezekiel 38 and 39. And, and this really is a sobering potential reality if you consider the likelihood that Ezekiel 38 could happen within the next decade or so. Now, I am in no way predicting the timing of Ezekiel 38, but many of today's top scholars in my studies believe that the stage is set for Ezekiel 38 to happen within our time frame, within our generation. So, um, you know, we could very well be here uh, you know, these this these generations be here when this uh, is to take place. Um, now, the Bible doesn't give us a specific date for the commencement of, you know, Ezekiel 38 and 39. And we're, we're currently, uh, you know, six decades closer than we were when Israel was re restored as a nation in 1948. It was rebirthed as a Jewish state, as scripture, you know, declared. So the question is, are we another 60 or more years until the Magog invasion? I don't think so. The prophecies that I've previously identified should all find fulfillment before the Lord upholds his holy name through his people Israel. And the possible exception to this would be the vanishing of the Christians, which we call the rapture or the catching away of the people of God. Now, the timing of the rapture could be before, during, or after Ezekiel 38 and 39. And, and, you know, that's all arguable. And I'm not going to spend a lot of time. I, I will get into a little bit more in depth, but I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time talking about it. I will say this. Our belief is that the Bible is, is crystal clear that the rapture occurs before the tribulation period, that it precedes the tribulation period. And, and and the Bible, I think, is pretty clear that, um, you know, the catching away of the church, uh, of the people of God, uh, is the removal of the restraining force that's allowing or preventing right now the Antichrist from coming on the scene and doing what the Antichrist is going to do. Um, but the timing of it arguably could be pre-mid-post, as they say. Um, and, you know, at the end of the day, whenever it happens... Uh, I'm going to be in it. Um, either I'm going to be in it because I've died and I'm caught up um, as the dead in Christ rise first, or I'll be alive, which I believe is going to be the case. I believe that we we will see it, that I will see the rapture. I will be alive when it happens is my belief. Um, it's just what I believe. Uh, again, I'm not in any way telling you that God told me, you know, Bishop, you're going to be alive when the rapture comes. So, don't don't put those words in my mouth. I'm telling you as a arguable fact that the rapture could occur, you know, which we believe pre or it could occur mid or it could occur post. The fact is, it's going to happen. And it's going to happen when God wants it to happen. Um, the question is, is are you going to be in it? Um, but we'll we'll talk a little bit more about it later on. But at the top of my, you know, list uh, for the timing of things or, you know, what's happening now is the book of uh, Jeremiah, the 49th chapter, the 34th through the 39th verse. That's Jeremiah 49, 34 through 39. And I encourage everyone when they have time to really begin to read these scriptures that I'm giving you. 
because this prophecy, which was authored uh, about, you know, 596, I believe, BC, give or, give or take a few years there. Um, but it seems to deal with what is presently taking place inside of Iran today. When you look at Jeremiah, the 49th chapter, I think that you can match it verbatim almost to what is occurring in Iran today. It's an ancient foretelling that breaks down into two major parts. And if you look at what's going on in Iran, you can see that both major parts are playing out right now. They're occurring right now. Jeremiah 49, 34 through 37 appears to be alluding to Iran's military matters, specifically uh, its uh, nuclear uh, and intercontinental ballistic missiles, or what's referred to as ICBMs. It also shifts topics from the military to a religious element and the burgeoning conflict between Islam and Christianity. Now, Many of you may not realize this, but presently Iran is producing the fastest growing evangelical Christian population per capita in the world. Christianity is growing at the pace of 19.6% per year in Iran. That is mind boggling, mind boggling. But this is what all of the studies show. Now, the nuclear showdown primarily concerns Israel versus Iran, and the spiritual showdown is between Islam and Christianity. So these are the two major things that are, are, that are happening, and they are occurring right now. Seven times. How many times did I say? Seven. Yes, seven times in the six verses of Jeremiah 49, 34 through 39, the prophet says, I will which alludes to what the Lord intends to accomplish concerning Elam. Elam is Iran. Now, after each uh, of the I will declarations, you'll find uh, a very important detail that's added uh, to help clarify the extent of what the predicted event is about. So when we connect the I wills with their corresponding detail assertion that's added, it brings understanding to the specifics of what the prophecy itself is about. So before identifying these seven I wills, it's important to locate uh, ancient Elam on uh, a modern day map. You have to understand what part of the world we're talking about. Now, Elam is the area of Iran that hugs the Persian Gulf. Elam represents about one fifth of modern day Iran and then Persia spreads across the remaining four-fifths of the nation. Now, prior to 1935, Iran was called Persia. Persia became Iran in 1935. About 2,700 years ago, two prophecies were issued about future judgments that would come upon Iran. Ezekiel 38 and 5 addressed the Persia section, that's about four-fifths of Iran, and Jeremiah 49, 34 concentrates on the one-fifth um, Elam, which is the uh, area that uh, borders the uh, Persian Gulf. Now, if you look at the map, you'll see that Elam is the location of Iran's Boucher nuclear reactor. It sits upon the convergence of three tectonic plates and is a nuclear disaster that is waiting to happen. And this is why there has been so much struggle against uh, Iran um, having the ability to develop nuclear weapons, even nuclear power. In addition to this reactor, we know that Iran has contracted with Russia to construct more of these nuclear facilities in the same general area of, this, of these uh, three tectonic plates. Now, we understand that the tectonic plates, they shift. And when these tectonic plates shift, earthquakes happen, okay? We experience those in California. Um, I, I can't think of the, the fault line that they're talking about, but 
uh, the name of, we have a specific San Andreas fault line. That's the name. Thank you, Holy Ghost. When we, when we look at that, we see that that's occurring here. Well, they built a nuclear power plant um, and, and arguably a nuclear weapons development uh, center right on the top of these of three plates in that region. Now, at this point, we need to look at the text of Jeremiah 49, 34 through 39 and identify what the seven I wills are within the text, because it's followed by the summary of the prophecies that I think that we can apply to what's occurring today. So the Bible says the word of the Lord that came to Jeremiah, the prophet against Elam in the beginning of the reign of Zedekiah, king of Judah, saying, thus says the Lord of hosts. Behold, I will break the bow of Elam, the foremost of their might. Against Elam, I will bring the four winds from the four quarters of heaven and scatter them toward all those winds. There shall be no nations where the outcasts of Elam will not go, for I will cause Elam to be dismayed before their enemies and before those who seek their life. I will bring disaster upon them. My fierce anger, says the Lord, and I will send the sword after them until I have consumed them. I will set my throne in Elam and will destroy from there the king and the princes, says the Lord. But it shall come to pass in the latter days, I will bring back the captives of Elam, says the Lord. Jeremiah 49, 34 through 39. So the seven I wills of the Lord in this passage of text. I will break the bow of Elam. Now, the detail that's added is at the foremost of Elam's might. And it's important that we recognize uh, that Iran is presently at or at least approaching the pinnacle of its modern uh, military and political might. It's getting to the point where it is a power in the region. Secondly, the Lord will gather the four winds from the four quarters of heaven. So this detail is that these winds will scatter the affected population into all the nations of the world, which alludes to a worldwide dispersion of the people of Iran. Number three, the Lord will cause Iran to be dismayed. The detail is that this debilitating judgment is going to be witnessed and probably caused by Iran's enemies. The inference is that Iran will be humiliated and extremely beaten down by its enemies. For the Lord will create a disaster inside of Iran, specifically the territory of ancient Elam. And the reason is because Iran has fiercely angered the Lord. This could be a nuclear meltdown in the region because they built it on those tectonic plates, something that could happen to open the earth. The Lord, number five, will send the sword after the Iranians. So the detail is until they are defeated, the sword will chase them. Number six, the Lord will destroy the Iranian leadership. And this detail is that after the, uh, uh, the aftermath of everything God is doing, the Lord will establish his throne in Elam. And he talks about the princes and the kings. So he's going after the leadership. Number seven, the Lord will restore the affected territory. So the details are that, you know, this occurs in the latter days and alludes to the return and restoration of the Iranians that are dispersed from that area or that fled the area when the disaster occurred. So in this prophecy, Jeremiah declares that a time would arrive when the Lord would be furious with the leadership of Iran. And we know this again because 4938 says the kings and princes will be destroyed. And this most likely represents the Iranian government that's in place when the prophecy takes uh, action. Now, the Lord would never destroy a good king or a good prince. And we can safely presume that uh, bad Iranian leadership then is the problem. How do we get that inference? Well, if you look at scripture, an example of a good Iranian leadership would be King Cyrus the Great of Persia. Remember, Iran was Persia before 1935. So the king uh, of Persia, Cyrus, uh, who lived um, around 600 uh, BC to 529 BC, would be considered a great king. Isaiah 44 through 45 predicted his arrival on the world scene a century before Cyrus was even born. Isaiah called Cyrus by name and confirmed that he was anointed by the Lord. 
if Iran's current supreme leader, the Ayatollah Khomeini, was a good leader like Cyrus, then Jeremiah 49, 34 through 39 would not be what's occurring now. But the Lord would be pleased with the Ayatollah rather than furious with him if he was a good leader. And we know that he is not a good leader. How, why do we know this? Why is the Lord fiercely angry with the government of Iran at the time of this prophecy? Well, the reason is because Iran wants to launch something powerful somewhere. And this is why the Lord will break the bow out, uh, at the foremost of Iran's might in order to prevent such a lethal launch. And we, we kind of get this from the um, belief that uh, Iran wants to launch missiles against Israel, wants to utterly wipe out Israel, destroy it so that there is no Israel um, anymore. So I'm going to, uh, I'm going to stop right there. Let me um, just put some notes here. So I'm going So again, we've talked about a lot in the last last two days. We're showing you how the modern day players are and what's occurring is matching scripture verbatim. We're seeing things that are occurring right now that match scripture. We're seeing things that could be developing. It looks like these things would be developing towards um, what scripture says. So I think that it's, you know, it's important that we pay attention as the children of God to what God has shared with us. It's necessary that we recognize this, but I don't want to get too much further into this um, due to the, the time. I'll just open the floor for any questions that you might have at this moment. Or if not questions, comments, or, you know, anything you'd like to share. Okay, let me ask you, is, is, is everyone getting something out of this? Uh, are you learning or you um, be beginning to see and understand the correlation between current events and what the Bible has prophetically uttered? Um, am I making this clear? Am I moving too fast? I mean, talk to me. Y'all Y'all are like dead silent, like. I'm keeping up for the most part. I wasn't the history major, but okay. I'm finding this very interesting. I've actually been reading um, Ezekiel and was trying to fit all the pieces together. Miles kind of got me started on that. Um, so I find it extremely interesting and it's good when you can take all that history and apply it to what's happening today. You know, so it's... Um, it's a lot, but it's interesting because the piece that, you know, we miss in there is the piece that you do like when you say, you know, uh, you do the timeline, like we can read it and say, yeah, this sounds like this is happening. But when you actually do the timeline and, you know, it was Persia here and then in 1938, it became Israel, you know, it starts to set all those pieces in place. So, or whatever date that was. Um, <laughs> Oh, not Israel, um, Iran. It starts to set all the, you know, all that stuff in place. So, yeah, I, I'm really enjoying this. Amen. Anybody else want to share or? I think it's interesting, Bishop, because um, just like was said before, it's um, it gives us a sense of urgency to uh, prepare to make sure that we're right with the Lord. As uh, we, the scripture says that a uh, look up when these things happen for our redemption draweth nigh these things that is being unfolded before us. Um, and I, I too, uh, not a hundred percent and a thousand percent 
of have uh, truly enjoyed what I've, I've listened to and heard and actually see it uh, unfold before us to if we have a relationship with the father, get even closer because he desires that because it's his will that no man should perish, but that we should all come to repentance and be uh, saved so that we could go back with him because these are definite indicators that we're living in the last days and not just to say haphazardly, oh, we're living in the last days. No, an alarm should be going off because these things are being set as you're bringing them out and they're plain. You're making it plain, which makes us accountable because we know now. We know now because you made it plain. You didn't make it no mystery. It's plain. And showing us directly in scripture and lining it up the way that it is unfolding or what have you, it uh, gives us, again, reiterating that same thing that I said, the sense of urgency to draw nigh even closer to the Lord as these, these things are happening. And realize uh, one of the scriptures that come to me that um, we have to uh, think about is the Psalm 91, he that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. Draw closer as these things are unfolding before us because definitely our redemption it draw off nigh. It's not that far, but I, I'm enjoying it tremendously. I didn't say much last week because I was stuck in awe <laughs> and, and listening to that and uh, studying some of that stuff on, on my um, own between me and the Lord in my own personal studies and to come together and uh, actually hear it reiterated and explain to me to where I can understand on things that I've even asked the Lord to show me so that I, he said, if you lack wisdom, let him who uh, lack wisdom ask of God. And then I come together. It's something about it when we dwell together in unity, Psalms 133, how good and lovely it is for brethren to dwell in unity, not just to come together physically, but on a spiritual level where we believe in and understand in the same thing. And I thank God for you open up my, my eyes personally to uh, go a step further to understand where we are, where we've been, where we are, and where, where he's trying to take us to with the timelines of events and scripture to back it up. Amen. Well, thank uh, each of you. We're going to stop the recording.